Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this edition of SolidWorks Manufacturing Live. Our topic today is business transformation with manufacturing ERP and MES. My name is Dick Longoria, and I am a Dassault Systems Del Mio Works Partner Manager. I work specifically with our, our channel partners for bringing uh, Del Mio Works ERP and MES uh, to, to the market space. And joining us today is Imtiaz Lodi, president of Aerosoft. And we're going to be discussing how customers can successfully transition from, you know, the ERP systems that they're using today, which could be homegrown or a variety of systems, um, a number of, of applications that may, might be disconnected, and how you can make that transition to an integrated manufacturing ERP. What we really want to convey today or help um, help everyone uh, understand more about is how best to prepare uh, for these types of transitions. What is What are some of the informations you need to know about yourself and what should you gather? What should you ask your vendors? Um, and this will better prepare you to make these types of transitions uh, more effectively. So welcome, everybody, and um, let's let's get started. MTS. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Hey, Thanks you know what? Um, you know why don't we why don't we take a, a quick moment and uh, and and give a, the audience a brief introduction about yourself, what you've been up to, and uh, what your area area of expertise is with Aerosoft. Uh, thank you, Dick. Um, my name is Imtiaz Lodi. I'm the president and CEO of the Aerosoft. Uh, we are a Deso uh, value add reseller uh, in North America. Uh, my personal side of it is that I have been with ERP and uh, and manufacturing ERP systems for last maybe more than 20 years, starting my career as an ERP yeah. analyst and then now moving into uh, implementing side of it, vendor side of it. Um, started the, started Arisoft back in 2005, um, looking at almost like completing 16, 17 years with the with the Arisoft journey. So. So far, so good. It's been it's been a great journey, learning a lot, and uh, here we are. Well, fantastic. You know, uh, thank you, MTS, for for joining us uh, on this segment. You know, I'm I'm really looking forward to to our conversation to to provide people the information that we kind of can we that we kind of talked about. You know, and and to kind of kick this this session off, I would like to um, take a look at you know. You know that that whole industry 4.0 area. Talk about it for just a moment, and also review some some survey results. But when we think about the industrial revolution, you know the first, second, third. You know we've all we've all been there. You know the fourth industrial revolution is is all about connectivity and gathering data in real time from the manufacturing floor. So when we talk about uh, Industry 4.0, we're really talking about uh, a digital transformation, you know, moving from paper to no paper, right, to digital applications, di digital information. And since everything can be connected in real time, I mean, look, even we can be connected in real time. I mean, you can put a watch on your wrist and you could be notified in real time, you know, of, of maybe, uh, you know, you need to take your medication. Maybe you need uh, an insulin shot. Maybe you're tracking your blood pressure. I mean, all this information is available. So there's no reason why manufacturers shouldn't also expect to grab that type of real-time information from a machine uh, or from entire, and then convert that that raw that information into usable information to drive decision making. And so that when we talk about Industry 4.0 and the fourth industrial revolution, this is what really is at, at the core uh, of, of this uh, whole topic. You know, so let's look at some, uh, some survey results uh, that will help us kind of point, uh, point the discussion in the right direction. This is an Industry Week survey that was done um, not too long ago uh, that I think will shed some light, um, you know, this topic. So let's take a look. Some of these results. Um, first of all, about who responded uh, to this survey. You know, there were of all these companies that responded. It, it's important to note that 74% of the companies that responded were $100 million in revenue or less, with nearly 50% uh, in the $10 million revenue range or lower. So I think this, this, um, the people who responded to this is a great cross section for for this conversation. Now. 
regarding these companies and their own digital transformation journeys, we, we identify that uh, the vast majority of them, 87% are either in an early or mid stage of digital transformation. And so this is kind of the basis of, of this information. And so, you know, what are, what are people looking at? What, you know, in this survey, we asked them, you know, what are the top 10 uh, business drivers or metrics that you use to evaluate performance? And those are actually listed in order of importance, you know, from gathering production metrics, cycle times, tracking quality, defects and rework, you know, on-time delivery yields. These are all things we're all familiar with. And what, what you're seeing in this graphic is those gray bars going horizontally across. For companies that are in their early stages of digital transformation, this is the percentage of companies that are seeing improvement improvements, areas, even in the early stages of transforming their businesses. And the dark bars um, are showing companies that are in that mid to advanced stage of digital transformation. So what we're seeing from these, from this graphic, from the people who responded, is that the trans, this, this digital transformation journey they're going through is having a significant impact on their businesses. And, and why is this important? Right. Well, it's really important because when you look at the challenges that are facing the manufacturing industry today, there's a lot of pressures. Right. I mean, what are our customers demanding? They demand new products. They want greater in, greater innovation. They want really cool products. They want higher quality. They want it right now and they want it at lower prices. And at the same time, manufacturers are dealing with some significant constraints and, and not all of these are, are, you know, can we manage, right? I mean, new design takes time and talent. Innovative design takes even longer to develop. Machines and floor space are expensive. And this is the way that we used to actually, you know, solve capacity problems, right? It's kind of like, you know, we'll add another wing to the, to the plant, we'll throw in some more machines, we'll hire a bunch of people, and we'll be producing 50% more. Well, those aren't necessarily the, the, the ways that we can actually increase uh, capacity. That's at least not necessarily our first choice. And why is that? Well, number one, it's expensive. Number two, you know, you know, gathering, gathering, you know, all this, all this is takes time and effort. And also hiring people is very, very difficult. There's a labor constraint. And so MTS, you know, this kind of sets the stage, uh, you know, for our con conversation today. And as we look at the top 10 business metrics, you know, you know, from your experience, your broad experience out there, you know, what are the primary objectives of companies? You know, what are they looking to achieve when they come to you? You know, what do they want to solve? Well, uh, usually there are two folds. Okay, one is more like trying to um, solve a process improvement side of the business. The other one is maybe they are at a different stage of their uh, digital transformation journey, meaning automation, uh, data capture, um, trying to eliminate the manual steps that they're currently doing. Um, so it's it's a combination of several several objectives that they try to uh, achieve by by uh, when they reach out to us. Okay. 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 Very good. And, you know, there are a lot of companies, you know, when they start this journey, you know, they might be using QuickBooks and Excel or other applications to, to manage their business. Maybe, you know, in their front office, customer quoting, you know, they also have to develop sales and work orders. You know, all this business, uh, all this business related functions and activities that usually take place in the front office, it's, it's very common, you know, to use different types of systems. Yep. And those systems work well up to a point, you know. So, what are the clues uh, that manufacturers might run into or should be aware of that indicate that maybe it's time to look at a change? I mean, what what are the pain points? Well, um, it it differs from like customer to customer, industry to industry, but uh, generally, um, generally they they would have a situation where they have outgrown their system. Uh, they started with something very small like QuickBooks, uh, moving on to uh, building their homegrown system. Uh, in certain cases, they, you know, the unexpected growth or a projected growth that they're trying to uh, be ready for. And, and, and these are some of the things that, 
that generally decide. And then rest of them are more uh, towards um, uh, operational, meaning um, they have multiple systems, desperate system, not talking to each other. Like you have QuickBooks, you have Excel file, and then maybe some of the other applications that are working in different silos. So these are some of the sort of like the business drivers that uh, look uh, the companies look for uh, before they start looking at the uh, you know the ERP or manufacturing ERP systems. So it could be a, a something as simple as you know what we're grad we're we're gathering information from the floor and maybe that information needs to be shared with the, with the front office uh, for scheduling or something like that or finance, but finance isn't speaking to those other systems, correct? And, and, and I think, you know, while, while you're kind of uh, reconnecting their uh, MTS, you know, a lot of times we find in, in companies that are, are, are looking to to transform their businesses or to solve problems, they there there might also be you know client driven initiatives. Uh, maybe these customers are are saying you know what um, you know you know the customer of the customer uh, your customer is coming to you and saying hey you know what systems do you have in place you know we have uh, you know various um, you know regulations or compliance requirements that we need to make sure that that you know our vendors and our suppliers can can meet so there are all sorts of reasons on why uh, customers might have have these requirements right absolutely um well i'm sorry i'm having a little uh, technical difficulty in terms of bandwidth here um not sure what exactly happened um but um to answer your question um i mean there are there are many areas um in in which where we uh, looking at um, helping customers in the areas where um, uh, can you repeat, Dick? Can you repeat the last part of your question, please? You know, we were talking about you know you know what are some of the what are some of the the clues or symptoms of that somebody needs to to look at new solutions, and we were talking about client driven initiatives. Um, you know that that might exist. Sure, sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, some of, like some of the, some of it we we discussed earlier, uh, like um, you know the business uh, projected growth, but uh, some of the other areas, including customer their own customer driven initiatives, like for example, um, the advanced shipping notification EDI, or um, if they are working with a tier one supplier, you'll be looking at uh, ILVS system where um, the automotive uh, uh, the tier one uh, manufacturers require. Uh, suppliers to 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 be um, uh, ILVS uh, enabled uh, and being able to uh, deliver products within let's say four to six hours of uh, lead time on the on the production floor. Yeah. So so what you're talking about is there there could be both internal or external okay. driven events that that have this have an impact. Um, you know, which kind of brings up a topic. Um, you know. When you think about ERP systems and organizations, when they put something in, what do you think the, the what would you say is the average lifespan of an ERP? Um, you know, how long do these things last? I mean, should I be able to should I be able to buy one and, and live with it for quite some time, or or, or what do you think? Well, again, there there are multiple factors. Um, obviously, if the technological advancement is one, um, sometimes you know customers have that we have seen in the past that they have been um, using QuickBooks and a combination of homegrown systems uh, for, let's say, you know, 10, 15 years now, but the technology that uh, existed 20 years ago is no longer, um, you know, viable in, in especially in uh, today's uh, uh, security environment, especially uh, uh, internet security and uh, uh, the, the insurance impact of that. So, I mean, I'll give you an example for one of our customers who's currently using ASP Classic application. So we're helping them with uh, upgrading that app application that was designed 20, 20, 20 years ago and bringing into the most recent uh, technology stack. So these are some of the some of the reasons. You know, I you know you speak about uh, obsolete technology. Um, you know, 
you know, isn't there a liability issue as, as well with some of these systems? Uh, I mean, is there an insurance issue that could potentially be at play with these types of, you know, types of systems? Does that play a role? Yeah, that's absolutely. I mean, it's a good question. Uh, and nowadays, if you look at the, your insurance renewal, the one forms that we also get myself as well um, as part of our uh, insurance coverages is that uh, they ask very detailed question in terms of technology stack. So um, absolutely, the obsolete technology is 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 uh, is a main factor uh, in insurance premium, insurance premium considerations. Okay, very good. You know, so so based on your experience, um, you know, how do you see companies um, going from where they are today to let's say an integrated solution? What does that journey look like? Well. I mean, it's different from different companies. I mean, if you're looking for a mature, a larger organization, they have a lot of processes already in place and they have the, um, the strength, uh, uh, the manpower needed to execute those projects. But for a small to medium sized organization, uh, the availability of resources uh, to focus on, uh, first of all, their, their current full day, day, you know, they have a full time day job. And then plus adding another burden of, uh, implementing a new system and introducing a new system, new training and everything, it can be a qu quite a daunting task for, for a sm smaller customer, small to medium sized organizations. You know, you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, just from the aspect of there, there, if leadership is, is driving a change um, and, and they, they know that, you know, what the objectives are, you know, we also have these organizations that have people that have been working for the company for many, many years, yep. you know, they, they're very comfortable with the systems they've been using. So, you know, what is, what does it look like for, you know, the, the team? I mean, how important is the buy-in of the organization as a whole to the success of these types of projects? Well, it's extremely critical. I mean, if you're not getting the buy-in from the operational uh, line managers and the staff, uh, it becomes extremely difficult to implement any project. So, um, and then, and then also, I mean, it's a, it's kind of like multi-stage process. Um, you know, um, there's initiative that the the management is taking that uh, they want to um, change the status quo from where we are today versus they want where the management wants to take this company into the next three to five years horizon. Um, they do consider all these facts, but um, as far as the uh, process is concerned from where they are today and then where it would like to be, it's a multi-stage process. It takes in okay. different phases. We go for the, you know, easiest way would be to go for like, okay, in a way, I mean, what is my minimum viable solution that I can implement that at least take our team away from current everything manual to some sort of a digitized uh, systems. Okay, very good. And you know, when we think about, um, you know, the ROI, return on investment of of an of an updated uh, integrated solution, you know, over a disconnected uh, system, you know, I mean, the the value of that sounds obvious, but it really isn't, is it? I mean, if there are probably both tangible and intangible benefits. You know, with respect to, you know, experience of your customers, um, you know, you know, can you talk a little bit about uh, about the, the tangible and non-tangible benefits of of this type of transformation? Sure. Um, well, in terms of tangible, that's more dollar oriented. Uh, we're looking at uh, and then as well as the efficiencies that we take out of these systems. Uh, now, the uh, typically, typically what customers like to see um that that if i today if i spend x number of hours in doing let's say month and close uh compared to uh post uh, going live on 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 some of these uh, manufacturing erp systems then this is one of the example where we we they can measure that you know in terms of labor hours that they were spending and 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 uh, eliminating the manual processes hence eliminating uh, potential uh, oversights, data entry issues, and in terms of non 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 tangible, that's overall improvement in your uh, department interdepartmental synergies because they're all working within the same data set. Um, technically speaking, it's a single version of truth. 
Okay, very good. And you know, when you, when you kind of think about the companies that that you dealt with, you know, to answer one of the questions that's coming in, what tends to be one of the top reasons that uh, companies finally buy into, uh, you know, uh, an you know an ERP or MES solution? You know, is there anything that finally gets those guys who are hesitating to finally make the make the jump? <laughs> that's a that's a million dollar question. I think. I think the some of these business drivers, um, it comes to certain level of maturity within the organization uh, that that uh, that when it starts, you know, there's two ways. Okay, one is inefficiencies, and the other part is dollar impact. So, if they start receiving um, uh, late late delivery charges, for example, it would be one example, uh, or uh, not being able to provide. Uh, um, advance um, advance uh, shipping notification on time. Some of these things that basically, I mean, I know one customer that we used to work with, uh, they used to supply, and if their trucks are not on the on the dock at certain time, they used to get penalized for that. So, so that actually that exists in 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 industry where people will pay penalties for not meeting a deadline. Correct. Right. You know, I, I, I remember you were, uh, I recall you were ta- telling me about a, one of your customers in the past, um, you know, a company that, that actually was using ERP. Uh, they had it in place, but they weren't using it to their full capability. And, um, and that, that, that your team had worked with them and you found that their quality was, their quality management was all, was all paper-based. Correct. Correct. And you know what did what did your team do there to to help them understand how to use what they had already existing to make it more effective? Right. Well, I mean, it's a it's a very typical scenario, right? You know, where the companies um, we call it um, fatigue, um, you know, implementation fatigue. Uh, when when customers go through a um, cycle of like big change from everything manual to the some sort of like you know, systems that um, where where everything is digitized along this way. Like I said, it's a multi-stage process. So what we do find, and uh, from from time to time, where we are meeting a customer that they have already purchased these systems but not implemented it. So as part of our discovery, as part of our engagement with the customer, uh, where uh, we we go we go through this um, this process with them. Um, in order in order to unearth some of these uh, opportunities where we can help them. You know, and so you kind of mentioned a discovery process. You know, when, when companies start going mm-hmm. down this path, you know, let's talk a little bit about that process. Um, you know, there is a discovery phase where you really need to understand what's going on in that organization to identify, number one, do we yeah. even have a solution that fits, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not a one size fits all, correct? Exactly, exactly. Well, so, uh, go ahead. Sir. Can can you talk just a little bit about you know what is you know about the importance of that discovery process, what you're trying to achieve, and what customers need to be able to share in order to make the most out of that out of of that effort? Well, you know, it's again um, we. we Every customer has its is own unique set of um, challenges and opportunities that, that are presented. Um, uh, in, in terms of uh, engaging engaging them with, with the right solution, there's no right, there's no like one size fits for everybody. Every customer has its own journey at it, its own um, um, time frame in which they basically go from where they are today into into the into the uh, fully fully implemented ERP systems. Okay. You know, and, you know, going back to some of the survey results that we were looking at earlier, mm-hmm. um, you know, you know, we were that those survey results actually focus more on the manufacturer side of, side of the business, but there's also, you know, all sorts of tools that are used by sales, accounting, procurement, et cetera. And with all the customers that you and your team at Aerosoft have worked with, you know, what are some of the key driving factors? That your customers have been searching for, on, let's say, on the front office side of the business. Well, 
I think the front office starts with the CRM, you know, the customer facing staff. Um, they are looking for ability to uh, effectively communicate with their customers, management uh, of their uh, lead management side of the business, uh, interaction with the customer, uh, document, uh, document management, meaning um, all their interaction with the customers are, 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 are done through, through effective uh, CRM management. Well, you know, and, and you had mentioned also uh, in a in a previous conversation that, you know, a lot of companies when they're when they look at, at an ERP, they're also trying to get a handle on, um, you know, raw material pricing, uh, and the change that is seems to be constantly happening. Can you talk about, uh, you know, the importance of of having a handle on that type of information and reacting? Well, I think. I mean, especially in a current post-COVID era, um, we're looking at customers, especially the front office staff, uh, the management. Um, you know, the the their turnaround time or expected turnaround time for their costing data, for their uh, supply chain information, the purchasing side of the business, uh, competitive pricing. This is all these data data points that that previously. Um, were not as as critical for the uh, you know you know pre covid scenarios that uh, that have become extremely important nowadays and they expect especially the front office staff we expect these uh, th these data inputs um, available at a um, lot more frequently vis-a-vis uh, -vis before you know I, it kind of reminds me i remember speaking to um you know, a couple of our, our customers out there and they were talking about, and this would have been more of, you know, the 2021, 22 timeframe, and hopefully it's, it's settled down a little bit, but mm -hmm. they were experiencing uh, price changes on raw materials on a monthly basis. Right. I mean, it, you know, I, you know, and, and the impact that that has on their costs and how they quote, you know, that just can't be underestimated, can it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, you know, which which kind of go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Dave. You know, which 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 kind of leads into you know that whole supply chain issue. Obviously, that's that you know that has been a big topic over the last several years. Um, you know, with respect to 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 manufacturing ERP and integrated solutions, uh, how important is it to be able to have some sort of um, method of managing your vendors or having a view into their performance. Um, you know, is, is that a key aspect for, for your customers? Absolutely. I mean, the, uh, most of our customers would like, okay. Some of them are at, you know, like I said earlier, um, every customer is a different stage of their journey. Um, but the management of vendor scorecard, um, the options, the lead times, especially especially on the raw material size, um, raw material size side, uh, um, it's, it's it's extremely important. So, I mean, the vendor score scorecard is, is is critical for a lot of customers. You know, in in, in terms of, um, like I mentioned, the the lead times and stuff like that. Yep. Go ahead. You know, it, it's kind of interesting. I, you know, you know, one of the, one of the the values of having. Uh, an ERP that speaks to its MES or can gather information from the MES, uh, that real-time data, is that when when a customer calls, um, you know, and says, "Hey, can you deliver ten thousand widgets in in ninety days?" You know, how do you know if you can deliver, right? And uh, I mean, you've got to know so much, right? You've got to know, you know, what do you have on the shelf that you can ship? You have to know what you need to manufacture. You need to know if I have the raw materials in stock to manufacture that. Can I fit it in the schedule? You know, and, you know, and if I, if I can fit it in the schedule, what's my manufacturing capacity, right? There's so many factors that go into to helping a, a salesperson be able to tell his customer whether they can or cannot um, deliver on time. And, Absolutely. You know, and, and when you think about all that, you know, we also that's where having that scorecard with those vendors comes into play, right? I mean, if, if do we have a vendor that is, you know, do they deliver on time? You know, are they providing complete shipments? 
you know, or partial shipments. I mean, there's so much there that has an impact on, on the overall business, isn't there? Absolutely. I mean, the, the quality, add, you know, added to the, you know, receiving side of the business. Um, I'm going to touch base on your MES part. Um, like you mentioned, um, that's the area that um, one of our, one of our customers who previously were using the ERP system, uh, fully implemented ERP systems right from your demand management um, processing of your, uh, you know, order to cash procure to pay, financials and everything, fully integrated system. The, but, but there, there was no MES, there was no real time uh, um, uh, signal capture of the machine data. So the production reporting was done manually at the shift level, at the end of the shift. Now, this customer, which is running about 200 machines um, out of, um, um, just outside Toronto, went from like switching it from one day in from an ERP, which was working absolutely fine from end to end, then taking it to the next level of data capture, machine production reporting data, capturing from the machine. And I, and I, and I still do remember uh, an email that I received from their uh, CFO that uh, just such a big change in like, their their mood, their overall happy happiness with the with the system. So it, it was a great story about that. That you know how, how impactful these these uh, small changes are. You know that's that's interesting. Um, so how often does that happen? Where a company has an ERP, and that's and that's maybe that's working great, right? Yep. But they have no visibility to the manufacturing floor, and right. so. And so, in, in, in you can go in there with the solutions and say, oh, right, here's the, the, ER, the MES side of it, and we'll connect it to your ERP and marry them up. Is, is that fairly common? It is. It is very common, especially ERP is a big commitment. You know, making changes which they have been using for 10, 15 years, uh, in some cases, very odd, but uh, generally it is about uh, six to seven years uh, when people are start looking at in terms of or reevaluate their ERP systems. But um, but in, in certain cases, you know, they are happy the way things are with some of the areas, especially on the production floor, where they find huge gaps that uh, their existing systems are not able to meet uh, their current um, uh, needs, uh, of not just only from, you know, production reporting side of the business, real time, but also handling exceptions, you know, situation on the floor, like you can create as best plan as you can, but when you hit, when the production plan uh, or a monthly plan hits the production floor, uh, there are always exceptions where you need to take down one of the, you know, work on priorities, different customers and, and uh, situations. So what in those, in those situations, what we do is, you know, we, we kind of like, um, uh, provide a solution that uh, with a minimum minimum um, effort where we can kind of like bridge those gaps by by introducing some of these systems that takes care of the production side of the business uh, nicely integrated with their existing ERP systems. Okay. Okay. And, you know, so, so let's kind of, kind of uh, talk about that a little bit. You know, I remember, um, the statistics that I, I read back a, a few years ago that 80% of, of, of customers will do a lot of self-education online and investigate all sorts of solutions before they ever speak to a, to a vendor. You know, they'll do 80% of that work on their own. And so for companies, let's say, that are beginning the process of, of looking at other solutions or are in that process today, what information should they gather about themselves? What do they need to know about themselves um, in order to get the most out of whatever technology choices they make? Sure, absolutely. Well, it just starts with, I mean, the business drivers, okay? What are the reasons why they need to be looking at these systems? And then um, they, they definitely need um, um, a complete um, assessment of their current processes, which is, what they have today, um, vis a vis, they would like to have it um, migrated to to the to the ERP systems. So, 
whether we have, you know, in a, there are many, many, many options available in the market today, especially for, for, for customers. Having the, having the, having the right software uh, for their business is, is, uh, is something that uh, is, is important. Okay. And, you know, when, when you consider all the moving parts, um, you know, that impact a manufacturing floor from material planning, procurement, scheduling, manufacturing capacity, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I recall, uh, you know, speaking to companies, you know, where, you know, all of their scheduling was done by one person. Right. It, you know, the, the, that one person is the keeper of the knowledge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, they have the best view, the pulse of everything. Uh, but that's also risky. Right. Um, you know, how, do, how can a company minimize the risk of, you know, one person holding all that tribal knowledge? This this is um, this is like time and again that we run into this issue um, uh, where they have a long term uh employees that that uh, they know it's kind of like gut feeling they know yeah. their environment uh, they know the numbers but uh, that's based on their number of years of experience having that person replaced or having you know some sort of like data driven decisioning is something that um, that they can take advantage of by implementing these systems you know, it, it kind of reminds me of a of a company I re, I remember back in the day, um, a company that was making some very complex uh, mechanical devices, and they were really big devices. Um, and there was this this you know the superstar guy who'd been there forever, right? And and he had to do that. One person was re responsible for all the quoting, yep. and the uh, the business owner was was very frustrated because. You know, he was actually, you know, in his organization, he didn't have control over or have any impact ability to influence how, you know, how many quotes this this person could actually manage. Right. He could only do so much. And uh, and it really was a limitation on his on his organization. And um, and he really needed to find a way to, to extract that tribal knowledge you know, and, and open up opportunities for the, for the business to grow. So it is a real, it is a real issue. It can be a real concern for, for organizations going through, you know, all types of growth and expansion. Absolutely. Well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, half of my, the audience of this um, live stream are probably thinking or thinking of a name in their own companies about that guy. They probably have a vision <laughs> right now. <laughs> Everybody has one of those guys. Everybody has one, one, one John or Mike or Michael um, <laughs> that's taking care of this. And, and absolutely, uh, it's kind of like, I wouldn't call it de-risking it, but um, complementing the, the employee or employees, uh, um, uh, their, their, their ability instead of like taking some, some of that information and then make it more process oriented rather than depending on that individual. As you know, that we have a we have a we have a, a huge uh, challenge with the labor market these days. Um, um, ability to attract and retain uh, the talent is has becoming has become a, quite a challenge these days for the HR teams. No, yeah, no question. And let's face it, uh, manufacturing companies looking to hire people. I mean, it's a it's a tough labor market no matter what, but, yep. you know, but there's so many um, preconceived ideas about what manufacturing is, you know, and and the truth is there's incredible technologies in manufacturing. Right. And um, and it, it's really helpful to, to help the the up and coming workforce understand that. I mean, it's a technology loaded industry. Right, you know, right. it's, it, it's it's not our our fathers or grandfathers manufacturing environment anymore, is it? Right. I mean, I mean, within within my own experience since 1993, being on the production floor of Toyota, um, uh, implementing these systems, uh, which I have done. I mean, that from from there to where we are today, uh, even on 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 the production floor, the number of users or the operators have uh, gone down drastically. And then they are even looking at even creating, uh, in some cases, uh, lights out environment. Uh, so the automation is big. Uh, pretty much every customer that we visit today, when you walk the floor, there's something going on, on in the automation side of the world. You will find, you know, 
someone, uh, you know, a couple of robot uh, robotics uh, projects sitting there. Uh, we have we have had uh, about a few customers in um, in the past um, year or so, where we where we kind of like help them. Not only it it's essentially deliver a multi vendor uh, project. So there is a robotic arm company, there's an ERP systems, and then there are conveyor belt manufacturer who are specialized, um, very purpose built uh, solution providers. Uh, uh, combining all these different vendors and then coming up with the automated uh, solution is uh, something that um, uh, um, we are quite proud of. You know, speaking of of um, you know other systems within the manufacturing environment, um, when you think about gathering information from the manufacturing floor, you know there's all sorts of type of equipment out there. There's machines that are you know older, non-computerized. There's machines that are CNC or have controllers on them. Maybe they're connected to a PLC. You know, yeah. or, uh, you know whether it's a machine or a robot system. Um, you know. How has Aerosoft dealt with those types of environments? Do, do you guys work on connecting those machines? Um, what is What do our customers, what do our people listening need to be aware of about that whole process? Um, good question. Well, we we do have the um, um, the ability to 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 work with not only the the current uh, PLC based uh, machines and then being able to harvest uh, PLC data. But also to the uh, to the machines that that are um, that are relatively a little bit older machines, but uh, with the IoT devices, uh, we are able to we are able to achieve a certain objective. The signal. Okay, so we could connect to anything, whether it's a, a a newer machine, older machine. We can put a piece of hardware on it, start extracting the data, and put it to work. Correct. You just need an access to the PCB. Absolutely right. You know, um, you know, and there's so many areas of a manufacturing company. You know, we talk a little bit about the the front office and all the types of, of of events and things that go on in that side of the business, and also the manufacturing floor. And one of the things we haven't talked too much about, and I kind of wanted to to ask you about, was was about quality. You know, about quality metrics. I mean, everybody counts good parts, bad parts. You know, and and people are all. You know, everybody puts in some sort of quality testing to ensure that they're, the parts that are being created meet the expect, expectations of, of their customers. Um, you know, but with respect, to, with respect to ERP, what should manufacturers consider when evaluating a quality system you know, for, for an ERPC? How does that play into it? Well, the quality starts right from when you receive the products, right from purchasing side, purchase receipts. So quality touches pretty much every aspect of, of any manufacturing organization. Um, it is impacting right here, right raw, raw material receipt side of it, uh, through and through within the production cycle, the reject reason codes, uh, the, the Pareto chart. <clears throat> Pareto chart. Um, so when we look at the quality, uh, and especially quality um, is very tightly integrated with with all the other aspects of your ERP systems. It's attached to your asset side of it from the preventive maintenance side. It is attached to your receiving side. Um, you're during the manufacturing process side. We use called SPC, where you're doing the statistical process. Um, uh, you know those quality aspect for sample testing, and then going out the products, which is the final FG testing, finish good testing. You know, this whole digital transformation is is all about continuous improvement, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. And then, um, I mean, um, I'm going to give you an example of, um, I mean, because I work with Toyota, and uh, we have a big, um, big focus on Kaizen. Kaizen is a Toyota philosophy on continuous improvement. And, and Every assembly line operator, assembly line leads, um, they're required to even participate in uh, Kaizen competition. So, um, absolutely. You know, you know, and, and Taz, you had mentioned you you kind of been at this for a long time. You know, you know, are, is there anything that we haven't brought up yet that uh, you know that viewers, you know 
should understand about this evaluation process of ERP systems out there. Um, you know, any 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 tips that you can give them on what they should what they should look for within themselves and in order to solve. Well, um, I mean, most of the clients that we we have worked with, uh, they they generally, I mean, it's 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 a continuous process, like like Kaizen. We are looking for improvement areas. How we can how we can sort of like approach first understanding the problem, understanding what where we are and where we plan to go. And if we have that scoped, then we look at you know what options are available, uh, what can we do, who we can talk to. And some of these areas, like some customers, um, um, I mean, there's a lot of um, consulting companies are available. We do this uh, on a regular basis of these discoveries. Um, so. There's, there's multiple avenues. You, you know, and, and speaking of that, um, are you aware or have you had any any customers take advantage of any government uh, grants or programs that might be available for manufacturers that are re that's related to, you know, digital transformation in their companies or ongoing training? Do those types of programs exist? Well, each country has its own, um, and not just countries, the state, and then uh, maybe potentially the regions, um, but someone's going to have to, there are some specialized uh, consulting companies out there that, that can find that for you. Uh, for, but uh, let's say I'm from, I mean, right now I'm sitting in uh, Toronto. So we, Canadian side of it is that we have a digital adoption program um, uh, from the government that has a component of um, grant and 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 a long term loan type of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I I think it's and I think it's worth mentioning. You know, this whole industry 4.0 is a global competition, if you will. You know, there each country actually might have a different name for it, exactly. um, but it's a global initiative, right? Yeah. Um, and 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 all the manufacturers that are out there, you know their competition is no lo longer just down the street and local of people that they know. I mean, there's, there's active um, organizations globally that, you know, manufacturing companies are getting together and trying to understand how do we compete uh, in other parts of the world. So, uh, I mean, the, the global competition is real. Um, right. And one of the growing pressures on, on the organizations out there. Yep. Absolutely. Um, well, Taz, I, I think we're getting uh, close to to the end of our of our session. You know, is there any other message uh, that you would have for companies that are going down this path? Um, you know, that you might be able to share with them that that might help them in their journey. Um, well, stay focused in terms of um, your um, your need. I think the need. I mean, they most car clients know what they need. Um, uh, it's just that, uh, you know, for companies like us, we just help them sort of like hand holding them in towards the finish line. This is something and not just like Arisoft, but companies like Arisoft and, and then the, the, the organizations like us. And, and, and you know what, and, and you brought that up. And I, I think before we, before we, we end, you're absolutely right. You know, companies do know what they need and there isn't necessarily a, a one size fits all. So what percent are, I don't know if that's a fair question, what percent, but are, you know, when you talk to customers, um, how many of them need something special that's not, you know, in the box? that you need to provide specifically for them. Is that a common occurrence as well? Well, um, it, it is common, um, but we generally go by 80-20 rule where your 80 to 90% of your requirements are met through out of the box solution. And then there are certain specialized need, okay? There is always something, uh, what I call it, um, the, the high business impact areas where as where we need to integrate and some of them requiring just compliance we, you know there's no go escape from it uh, we have to be compliant but um, generally like you know those areas are more we, i would say between 5 and 10% of the customization other than that i think we we the solutions that we we have are available in the market that uh, takes care of most of it most of the other part and and these solutions can be 
be deployed in a variety of fashions, right? I mean, it's, you know, whether a, a customer, if they're in a highly regulated industry, you know, and they want, you know, a, you know, on premise type of solution versus a, a cloud based solution. I mean, we have a, a variety of ways to deploy these solutions. Absolutely. Absolutely. We do. We do. Okay. Very good. Well, Taz, I want to I want to thank you for your time today. I know we covered. I know this is a big topic. You know, there's we can go there, on for another two hours. <laughs> we could go on and on and on, um, and and we know that we're just scratching the surface, and that uh, for for everyone listening, you you may have some questions. Uh, you know more about uh, ERP, and and we're always here to to answer questions, and and uh, and you certainly can reach out to Taz as well. And so uh, with that in mind, Taz, I, I want to thank you for your time uh, today. Really appreciate it. And, Thanks for inviting uh, me. You're welcome. And until next time, uh, you know, look forward. And we look forward to our next episode of, of SolidWorks Manufacturing Live in the, in the not too distant future. Thank you very much. Thank you.